Awesome. That's so great. <laughs> I love you. We love you guys so much. Thank you for everything. What a team. You know, many times people see, you know, people like Andrew or me and Carly or the worship team or whoever. But you know what? We are around here. It is so not about who's on stage. Right. We have the easy part. It's really a whole team effort. And yeah. we so value everyone and, and what they do here to be a blessing to everybody yeah. else. We couldn't do this without them. So, yeah. Great, great stuff. Good people. Amen. How many of you said that you were wanting to come to Karis if there was no obstacle? Let me see your hands again. Well, wow. I tell you what, you know what, that is, if that's the desire of your heart, I can guarantee you that the devil did not give that to you. Yeah. Amen. When you delight yourself in the Lord, the Lord gives you the desires right. of your heart. Absolutely. And I tell you what, Tracy and I have been so blessed. Tracy, would you stand? I don't think I've even introduced you this entire conference. This is my Yay. wife. Behind every good man, there's a great woman. That is the truth. And we are all so grateful for all that God is doing. But I think Tracy and I, uh, for about uh, eight years, um, I came back to Colorado Springs in 2003. And I thought I was going to be teaching in a school of worship here in town full time. And I did do that for two years, but it was very, very part time. And so, uh, part time, full time. Yeah, and we had moved back from Idaho. We thought it was a done deal, and you know, just the way things happen sometimes. And so, it was very, very part time. And uh, did that for about seven years as a faux finishing business, a decorative painting business. Listen, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would be out of full time ministry. I had to do that one more time. I and, think we're uh, counting. I think yeah, someone has a clicker. Yeah. And you know, honestly, it was one of the best things that happened to me because it was like I got put on the backside of the desert and God began to realign some things. If I had been where I thought I was going to be, I would have been in some very dysfunctional and toxic environment. And I had no idea that that's what would have happened, but God really was protecting me. Praise God. And in this time period, I'm telling you, God totally prepared me for what I'm doing now. And mm -hmm. in the fall of 2010, I get a call from Andrew one morning, and I'm standing in this multi, multi million dollar home uh, with all of my painting supplies in a, a eight car garage next to a Zamboni. What's that? A Zamboni is the machine that you see that goes out in the ice skating rink yeah. and makes the ice all smooth. And they had they an ice that? hockey arena attached oh. to their house. Wow. Oh, wow. A full regulation ice hockey arena, for oh, wow. real. Nice. And Andrew says, Daniel, this is Andrew. And that conversation was the beginning of the best thing that's ever happened to us, aside Amen. of Jesus and my wife. Amen. Amen. So I tell people now, you know, a faux finish, for those of you who don't know, it's layers and layers of decorative product. And um, it's not just putting paint on the wall, but it maybe is sometimes up to 25 layers of different wow. things. It sounds like makeup on the wall. It does. It's kind of like that, literally. And so I tell people today that I feel like a faux finish of gratitude. Amen. I'm just layers and layers and layers of thankfulness for God's faithfulness. Jesus. And Carly, I just want to publicly say thank you for coming alongside of me. You and Ashley, when Gary Lukey asked me to be the director of the healing school, I, I absolutely was thrilled and excited. But I, I had no idea how this whole thing was going to work. And because this has been such a passion for Carly and Ashley, uh, they came up to me one day and said, you know, if there's anything we can do just to be a blessing and be a help, uh, we'd love to do that. And here we are now, four plus years later. No, it's been and a fun God, ride. to God be the glory. Amen. 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 But I just want to say thank you. It's been a privilege. Amen. And you know, one of the things that I learned while I was on the backside of the desert was that there is a better way to pray. And I got a hold of one of Andrew's books, and, and you all know this book, or at least if you don't know this book, you need to know this book. Because I had been so involved in the intercession movement and so involved in, in uh, you know, 
this kind of attitude that was all about tearing things down from the heavenlies and, you know, getting a thousand people to pray because it would be more effective. How many of prayer is an awesome, awesome thing? Right. But when I got a hold of Andrew's book, my wife can tell you, I literally sat on our love seat and I began to just weep because I realized that this book was going to be the beginning of a whole shift for me and that the finished work of Calvary was going to be expressed in a way that was going to become a part of my every day. And this better way to pray is what we're all talking about this week. I mean, this whole concept of the grace of God and coming from an already finished work. Somebody asked me last night about Sozo ministry. There's a ministry that's very famous in our country, you know, called Sozo. I have no problem with that whatsoever. It's fabulous. But you know what? We've got to be careful that however we approach healing, we approach it from an already finished work. Right. And if we come to our prayer closet feeling like I'm going to have to get God unstuck, you know, it's going to be my intercession that's going to move God because I don't know, for some reason, he's just not so willing today. And if I just get powerful enough, if I just spend enough time, if I just get effective enough, I'm going to move the hand of God. Listen, you know what? It's going to move. You're going to move because you're going to be so exhausted. Right. It's going to get more and more tiring, more and more weary, and you're going to eventually become weary in well-doing. But Jesus said, through his grace, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So we want to go back to this idea of a better way to pray, but also uh, just to recap a little bit about active and passive faith and to take us into this next uh, time. And Carly and I were in the green room earlier this morning just saying, man, we so wish we had at least two or three more days (laughs) to be able to teach uh, so much more of what we have. But we do encourage you to get the prayer training manual and uh, make it a part of your church, make it a part of your Bible study. We teach this differently every time we teach it. And we never really know for sure what we're going to say. We just lean on the Holy Ghost and out it comes. He knows what's happening. Yeah. One of the things I said when I first came to Karis, I was uh, trying to give a praise report one morning and I had only been there for about three or four months and someone asked me to talk and I got up and I said, you know, one of the things I love about Karis Bible College is you come in one way and you come out the other end. Well, I think you said something like it's, it's not important what goes in, it's what comes out that matters. And I kind of paused and I went, oh, whoops, that didn't sound good. Yeah. But how many know when you hang around the grace of God, you hang around the presence of God, you hang around the true nature of God, I'm telling you, you can't help but be changed. And it it really is effortless change. As you get into the word of God that's alive and powerful, you begin to realize, man, I am literally being transformed. Amen. Your mind is being renewed. It's being renewed. Your emotions are being renewed. Your Mm -hmm. will is being renewed. Instead of, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. Just let me retire. Let me whatever. You know what? Your will is being renewed to where all you want now is the will of God. Right. All you want is to see the kingdom of God made manifest. Amen. And somebody brought in another little apparatus over over here. We've got a breathing machine Down here in the corner. that showed up over here this morning. It's also, it looks like there's a, some kind of orthopedic pillow as well down there. I'm telling you, this is fun. You know what I'm saying? The kingdom of God is awesome. And I'm so grateful that we get to be a part of this end time harvest. And when I say we, look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. He's talking about you. Amen. We get to be a part of this end time harvest that God is doing today. It's good news. Amen. So Carly, in a better way to pray, uh, we've got authority. We do. We've got authority in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. We've got authority over sickness. We've got authority over disease. We've been talking about how important it is to speak out what it is that we believe. Mm -hmm. Because faith is literally voice activated. Amen. And you know, really, if we want to, if we want to look at for a good example of how to pray, I mean, I've learned over the years of uh, lots of ways of how not to pray. Boy, me too. Yeah. I did everything short of flying up into a 747 you know. to get up into the heavenlies and be more effective in my prayer life. You know, we've, we've all been there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God that's over. But rather than this turn into some kind of confessional, let's... <laughs> it's good for my soul. You know. Yeah. We've all, we've all been there. You know, um, I used to just spend so much time 
Um, my, my prayer life was always repenting, you know, sin, repent, Me too. Yeah. sin, repent. Because that's sin, what you're repent. focused on. Yeah, totally. And just l- left with that feeling like I, could, I just wasn't very good at being a Christian. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, I was a disciple. You never measure up. Never measure up. And um, it was exhausting because everything was based on performance. Yeah. And you never can be, you never can get everything good enough. Right. You know, or up to the standard that, that I thought would make God pleased with me. Yeah. I wanted, I so badly wanted to just make him proud of me. Yeah. And always felt like I was just missing the mark. Right. And so uh, my prayer life in the morning was just repent, don't sin, repent, don't sin, repent, don't sin. Just this vicious cycle. And, you know, I think, it, I think honestly, it was as traumatic for the Lord as it was for me. You Probably. know, and, until, I, until I really got a hold of this teaching and a better way to pray. And suddenly, I'm like, wow, if I just look at the example of Jesus, how Jesus prayed for people, yeah. man then I've got nothing really to say to the Lord. Yeah. My prayer life, would com- I mean, it ruined me. You know, I didn't know what to do in the morning. I'm like, well, Jesus, can yeah. we just sing? I what mean, do we do? Can, we just, can we just chat? And in that time, I realized the value of relationship. Yeah. What that did was set me free to just have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Just to be intimate, just to, to chat to him in everyday conversations like I talk to you. You know, in Genesis, when God came down and walked and talked with him, what do you suppose they talked about? The birds and the there was bees nobody and to be saved yet. And, yeah. There was nobody to be healed yet. You know. I mean, just fellowship. Just fellowship. Just hanging out hanging with Jesus. Hanging out with Jesus. Come on. Man, that's what I'm I'll talking tell you, that about. That was good. Right? That was good. Man, that, and that freedom on the inside of me helped me to understand how much he loved me. And yes. then I saw my faith, you know, faith works by love. And so my faith became effective. Yes. And it just had this huge knock on effect. And it all began really with understanding that. If we just, if you just follow the example of Jesus, yeah. it doesn't get much more simple than that. Yeah. And so my, my prayer life completely turned flip side, flip side, well, right side up. Right side up. Right side up. Yep. But let's look at some of these examples yeah. here. Um, in Mark 1 verse 25, it says, Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. Yeah. Now the thing I notice about this statement here, and there are lots of them, so we're just going to pick out a few. But Jesus didn't ask God to come down and fix the problem. Right. He didn't, you know, phone a friend, call the prayer chain. He didn't gather the disciples to hold hands in a circle. Um, you know, he spoke directly to the problem. He didn't even pray. It wasn't even, it was a statement. And there wasn't, if it be thy will, Lord, tagged on the end of it. Right. I wasn't even sure that was a prayer. Yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't think it was a real prayer unless you tagged that on the end. We said, but, if it be thy will for everything as a everything. Baptist, except yeah. when we ate. Because that... Because it didn't matter if it was his will or not, right? You were going to eat anyway, I guess. We didn't care. By that point. No. We were really good at those potluck suppers, let me tell yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> that means something else in Colorado now. Yeah. yeah. Let's not go there. Can't have potluck. No. Can't do potluck anymore. Yeah. Let, let's not even go there. Don't go there. Okay. But Jesus rebuked him. You know, now this word rebuke, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly strong word. Yeah. You know, but, but Jesus was di- talking directly to the problem. This was a demonic issue. And he just says, be quiet and come out of him. Notice he didn't carry on a conversation with the demon. Right. And notice Je- Jesus didn't rebuke her. He wasn't the person that he was aiming his words at. Right. It was the condition. So when, when Jesus rebuked the fever, do you suppose he kind of stood there? He says, so he stood over her. Do you suppose he kind of stood there and said, I rebuke you? Maybe. <laughs> We make it all about the word rebuke, don't we? You know, when we think we're going to rebuke something, it's all about that word, as if there's something magic about the word. The word rebuke is really an action word. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? I'm going to say to that sickness, I'm going to tell you where to go. See, I'm going to take authority. Where does the authority come from? See, you've got the power and the authority. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say to that situation, forget about it. No, this is not going to happen to her. See, I'm forbidding it to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm taking my authority over that. That's a strong statement. Yeah. And you know, there's another example here in uh, Luke 4, 39. It says, so he stood over here, meaning Jesus again, and rebuked the fever. This time it's a fever and it left her and immediately she arose and served them. Yeah. So again, there we go. He's rebuking the fever, not the lady. Yep. He's rebuking the fever. And then uh, Luke eight fifty four. 
but he put them all outside. And now this is interesting. This is interesting. He put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, "Little girl, arise." Yeah. So the room was filled with all of these mourners, and many times when you're in a situation where family is around you, the family will actually many times become a distraction. It depends on how they've been trained, you know, how they their mindset. But um, many times it's all about, uh, I w- I'm thinking of a story right now about uh, three plus years ago, we had a student who was um, near death and the family, I had been ministering to uh, Sheldon, mm-hmm. remember Sheldon mm-hmm. Davis? And I'd been ministering to the family and to Sheldon and, and um, we, we were just believing God together. And uh, when I went into the hospital, Sheldon's extended family, you know, came and, you know, many of them were on church. They were people who were very full of sympathy for him, Mm -hmm. but there were three or four people that really had this message Mm -hmm. of the authority of the believer. And so uh, what we did was we asked the members to leave the hospital room so that we could effectively minister to this particular person. So let's just explain why would why would Jesus or why in, in that situation did you ask people to leave the room? Right, because that can be a little bit rude, right? It could I mean, be a little rude. It could be a little bit like, uh, oh, what, what's going on here? Yeah. So when Jesus came into a situation, uh, again, I think Andrew mentioned this the other night as well. In one particular town, uh, we know the story of how he could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief right? And I love that particular passage because it says that he just could heal a few sick folk. Just a few miracles. Well, in today's world, healing a few sick folk would be like revival, <laughs> you know? But you know, this really highlights the, um, the problem of unbelief and how strong a pull it has on people. He didn't say he couldn't do many mighty works because they didn't have enough faith right? or even because of their sin. Now those, those things, you know, have, have, a, have a part to play in all sure. of this, yep. but specifically unbelief even troubled Jesus. Yes. This is Jesus, the son of God who, who operates in everything perfectly right. and in whom there is no sin. Who, 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 I mean, he's, he's our example. And yet unbelief hindered Jesus ministering to people. Yes. If it, unbe- if it hindered Jesus ministering to people, yep. do you think it's going to hinder us ministering to people or yep. has the potential to? It's got the potential. It's got the potential to, right? Yep. So what people believe directly affects what they can receive. That's right. We cannot bulldoze each other into receiving salvation. Right. Did anyone else in here have their, have their arm twisted up their back to receive salvation? No? Did anyone put a gun to your head and say, you will believe? I mean, it, it wouldn't be very effective anyway. You can't bulldoze somebody into receiving from God. Yeah. They have to partake in it. And it's the same, you know, it's the same with salvation. It's the same with healing. They, there has to be a two-way thing. So unbelief um, clearly affects people. And in this situation, had there, you know, unbelief causes an atmosphere. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get around people that are really negative. Oh, it's amazing. It's like a cancer. It is like a cancer. It's just they're hard to spend time with. Yeah. You have one person who can be thankful in a group of people and you can do just the opposite. That thankfulness can begin to infiltrate that that climate. This is a really big deal for us who are in the world of worship. And we come into a space and in this space, of course this space is like my favorite space, you know, this, this is so anointed from all of the prayer and the worship and, yeah. and you know, all the things that have been spoken over this. But, you know, you, we, I travel with Andrew some and we go into auditoriums, we go into uh, performing arts centers, we go into all kinds of venues, don't we, Carly? Mm-hmm. And uh, many times you'll go into that room and you'll, you'll have a sense about that space. Well, see, when I walk into that space, I have authority over that space. Mm-hmm. Amen. I'm not going to let that stuff dictate to me, but we can't just, you know, que sera, sera. Mm -hmm. We've got to take our authority Mm -hmm. in those moments and begin to change that atmosphere to the glory of God. And we're very intentional with our prayer ministry team here and with the ministry that goes on. We want to create that atmosphere of faith. Yeah. That create that atmosphere of expectancy. Because in that place of expectancy, people get to believe in that nothing's impossible. Yeah. They start to focus on Jesus, on the answer rather than on the problems, and it helps them to receive. I was in um, a church one time, and it was um, actually Hannah had just been healed, and we were super, super excited. You know, we have our new, th- our newly, it felt like she was born again, honestly, oh, I'm and sure. our three year old yeah. baby girl that's running around and eating and talking and walking, and I mean, we were beside ourselves. And so after, after she was healed, we drove all the way back down to our, our um, home church. The next, we wanted to get, it was a Saturday night, we wanted to get back for church the next day and show off our brand new baby girl. And we were so excited. 
And um, we went into our church and um, the, the, we started, you know, people, some people were excited, some people were not excited, some people were offended. It's amazing yeah. what healing would do in the body of Christ, you know. And there was those people that really embraced what had happened to Hannah and saw it for what it is. I mean, she's sitting there eating donuts, for goodness sake, you know. We, so it was, it was pretty obvious what had happened. They'd walked through this whole journey with us. And there were other people that were just offended because, you know, well, you know why aren't I healed? It's just a different, different perspective. And then, there, you know, we, some people ask us to pray for them. You know, when, when you start seeing the miraculous, it has interesting effects on different people. It does. But there was one guy, and he, um, a friend of ours, and he'd been in a motorcycle accident several years earlier. He was um, a traffic cop. And so mm. now he was retired because the, the motorcycle injury had paralyzed his whole, his whole arm. Mm-hmm. And so he just kind of hung there limp. You know, mm-hmm. it was all intact, but it just, he'd ripped all the nerves out of it and it wasn't working. And so we, we started talking to him and we'd been talking to him about faith and he'd seen this whole journey and the progression of how we got where we got. And, uh, and he's like, oh, he was excited. He wanted us to pray for him. So we started praying for him and his arm started doing this. I mean, and flipping around in circles. I mean, it was going crazy. Like, you know, it was under some kind of influence it was it was wild I mean right. he, he couldn't move it at all it was limp and it was doing full-on windmills wow and he was so excited and then this guy from the other side of the church um his wife had been very offended with Hannah being healed and I think that offense is also contagious it, mm-hmm. it breeds and he came walking over to the situation and he looked at, at my friend Simon and he said oh see it doesn't work properly does it and it, Simon's face just dropped, and his arm went limp. And he never did get that full manifestation. In that moment, it was like, it was like the enemy sent him with those words to kill I him. I feel the spirit of slap coming oh on me my right goodness. now. Oh I've learned a goodness. few more things since then, but I would have exercised that for sure. Wow, that's I, so... But that's, that's the problem with unbelief. See. It and really you know, is. and and while it might seem unkind for Jesus or or even Daniel in that situation to put people outside the room, we don't have to be mean about it. No. If you can sense that, you know, spiritually, or you just pick it up from what they're saying, yep. a nice way to avoid conflict, I find, right. is you know, especially if it's um, a loved one. Right. You know, is just understand where the family are coming from. That's it. You know, your family will love you to death. Right. You know, it's. It, it's just, it's, it's not that they're mean, it's just oftentimes because they love them so much, they're terrified of losing them. And they find it hard to be in a position of faith. One day there was a, I remember a particular incident of a lady at a conference and she'd, her family came in the wheelchair, with, she was pushing her in the wheelchair, she had stage four brain cancer, and um, she was just, I mean, almost like vegetative. She, yeah. was, not, she was not able to, to even really open her eyes, she was just sitting there in the chair wasn't able to communicate at all. And her family came up and you could just see on their faces sheer terror. They were just destitute. It's like they had, they had no other hope but Jesus. And, but there really wasn't any faith there. Yeah. You know, it was more desperation. Right. And here's the thing. Desperation is not faith. Yeah. What, what, just, what's the difference? You know, you can really, really, really want something to be true. But that does it desperately. I can really, really want to believe in this healing thing. I can really, really want to be well. But it's not a position of faith that says, you know what? I know I'm healed. I know what the Lord's done for me. I'm I'm taking it. I'm going to get it. It's mine. Because faith is the evidence. Faith is the evidence. Faith, the violent take it by force. Amen. We spoke yesterday. It has an attitude. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Come on. Okay. Come on now. Come on. All right. (laughs) But in these people, I wasn't sensing any faith. I was sensing a lot of desperation. Yeah. You know when people are in faith because there's a peace. This is huge. There is peace in faith. When somebody's mind is completely stayed upon the Lord yeah. in the midst of the ho- most horrible crisis, yes. there can be peace. Yes. That, that's knowing that, you know what? God's got this. Yeah. I, I okay. think, think of that example the other night when Jesus is in the boat. Oh, yeah. And these are all seasoned fishermen. I mean, they're people who knew that culture, and they're, they're kind of freaking out. But Jesus has already told them, go to the other side. Right. I mean, you're not going to drown the Messiah, are you? And he sleeps. Right? That would be really bad of God, wouldn't it? A drowned Messiah. I had a plan for, to save humanity, but uh, whoops, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't anticipate that storm. No. Who would have known? That wave just took him out. 
But God, but the Lord told them to go to the other side, and That's so right. you know they had no reason. Even though the circumstances looked horrible, they had no reason to lose their peace. But they had a word, didn't they? If they followed the word of God, they they wouldn't need to be afraid. Right. But anyway. This lady, um, you know, she was she was just at the end of her she was yeah. at the end of her life, really. Mm-hmm. And sensing this this desperation, I just said, you know, I'm going to take really good care of your mom, but I, I just I just needed let me just take her over here and talk to her by myself where it's less noisy. So I took her to the side of the stage. Said, you just take a seat. You can sit right in the front row there. I'm not going to harm her. I promise. I'll bring her right back. I didn't say thou of, of of unbelief. You full of viper and... <laughs> you brood of vipers. You know, you can be... You need, we need to minister out of compassion. This is huge. And we talked about it the other day, but, uh, you know, one of the things, Carly, I think that uh, people can identify with you about is the fact that you were a nurse. Mm-hmm. Not everybody has to be a nurse, obviously, to be compassionate. But I think of someone who... There's lots who, of nurses on. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think of how much compassion you have to have to do that. It's the love of God that propels us to minister to people. Yes. Amen. And we minister out of the overflow of our relationship with him. Yeah. Amen. So when we're, when we're ministering to people, we want to extend the love of God to them above every, anything else. Anything. Love never fails. Right. And, you know, I, I managed to speak to this lady by herself. And as I was praying for her, you know, the Lord showed me um, because she couldn't communicate. Yeah. So I just started praying in tongues. I'm like, I can't, there, there isn't anything coming forward here. Right. But I started praying in tongues. And what the Lord showed me was that she didn't feel worthy to receive. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just explained that to her. I said, you know, the Lord's just showed me that you don't feel worthy to receive healing. Which is very common, isn't it's it? It's very common. And you know, especially in cases where people feel like the illness has, um, is their own fault. Right. You know, and Barry, Barry touched on this as well, but there is nothing that disqualifies us from receiving healing. Right. I mean, the Lord died for us while we were yet sinners. Yeah. You know, he's, he's I mean, otherwise, how, how would unbelievers get healed? Right. Everyone that Jesus ministered to wasn't saved. Right. Right? So, I mean, we, were, we're, we can be in that category of it's not based on our performance. It's That's based right. on what Jesus has done. Amen. And as I ministered the love of God to this lady, she started to weep, little silent tears that Even started to drop she down her. Talk. She couldn't talk at that moment. But as I said, you know, you are worthy. Jesus made you worthy. I said, I want you to say after me, I am worthy. And she, her eyes opened up and she lifted up her head and she said, I'm worthy. As clear as anything came out of her mouth. And by the end of it, she was up at that wheelchair and walking. She was completely healed. Amen? That's the love of God. That's the love of God. That's the love of God. Yeah. But it was important for her family to have some distance yeah. because I think that them being there, they would have loved her to death. That's you know? huge. Yeah, so we can do that nicely. Yeah. It was a long way around, but we got there in the right. end. Right, yeah. All right. So um, Mark 5, 34 says, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. There's lots of different examples of faith. But um, what about that one? Yeah, so, um, you know, when Jesus would often speak to people about their situation, it, he was always moved by compassion. Jesus wasn't moved by some power trip or some identity crisis where he had to be the, the powerful minister. And, you know, if you take it upon yourself to be that person's answer for their healing, you're going to get into a really, really bad place. Mm-hmm. Because it is not about you. It's about you releasing the life of Christ into that person. Mm -hmm. Not your personality, not claiming responsibility for their healing. And you know, it's really subtle because when you're laying hands on somebody and you're seeing the manifestation of that healing come into that person, there's always that temptation to think, whoa, I really am anointed. (laughs) Praise God. I'm such a big deal. Touch (laughs) me. You know? And listen, it's so not about you, amen? You don't have the power to blow the fuzz off of a peanut. (laughs) Amen? Without Christ, you can do nothing, but we're not without him. Amen. Amen? And in him, we can do all things who strengthens us. Amen. And I love how he says, go, you know, go your way. Your faith has healed you. Yes. You know, it was what, it was her believing, her putting faith in a, a positive response in what Jesus, in Jesus' power. Yeah. You know, it, and there it, kind of, it really just comes back to, you know, we, we sometimes think as, um, when we're ministering to people that it, everything's on us. Yes. But, you know, the person coming from ministry has their part to play too. Yeah. 
You know, what people believe directly impacts what they can receive. Absolutely. I'll give you an example. You know, sometimes I minister to people and in their heart, they see themselves getting a little bit better every day. A little bit better every day, you know. I mean, this is this one lady, and um, she was she was a young lady about to get married in her. Uh, she was in a wheelchair. She was paralyzed. She had a car accident. She was paralyzed, and um, I didn't pray for her actually because as I was as I was speaking with her, she she mentioned to me that the Lord's told me I'm going to be healed on my wedding day as I walk down the aisle, which is in six months' time. I'm like, well, then why have you come up for prayer now if that's where you've put all of your faith? Good question. She would not be moved from that. And, you know, people sometimes, we can limit God with the way that we think it's yeah. going to manifest. Yes. Now, I don't care if you get healed a little bit better every day or if you get it all in one go. It makes no difference to me if you get there in the end. Right. The main thing is we want to see you well, right? Right, right. But I believe that God's best mm -hmm. is for us not to spend another one more night with the frogs. <laughs> right? Do you remember Pharaoh, oh, that whole yeah. story? Well, I think I'll keep the frogs one more night. Right. It just, to me, why would you want to, you know, we talked about this yesterday. Why would you want to live with a little bit of Satan in your body, you know, for another minute? Right. If sickness and disease is from him, I don't want him operating. I don't want his power operating in my body for another second. Exactly. But, but how people believe that healing is going to manifest actually can put God in a box. Yes, it can. You know, and, and, and whether it's progressive or whether it's, whether it's instantaneous, I believe it's God's best yes. for us to receive instantaneously every time. Amen. So when I minister to people, that's what I, that's what I expect that's to what happen. That's what I expect too. And that's what I teach people. Now, what happens if you pray for someone and nothing happens? And we see people who often say that to me or to us. They'll say things like, well, nothing happened. Well, how do you know? Right? When the disciples saw the fig tree, they didn't think anything had happened after Jesus spoke the word over that fig tree, you know? And many times people are, again, are so carnally minded that they're looking for a confirmation in the physical realm rather than letting the word be their confirmation. Right. See? And we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes. And we're not looking for a physical condition to determine a spiritual position. Right. We're healed because the word says we're healed. We're yeah. healed because of what Jesus already did. I don't care if my body shows it or not. And you know, many times there is, a, there is some kind of a physical uh, response. You know, we, somebody asked us yesterday in the panel, uh, why oftentimes when people are ministered to, do they fall over? And I loved Pastor Dwayne's answer when he said, because they can't stand up. You the know? power of God in them is so strong. The people buckle at the knees. They just buckle, mm -hmm. you know? So many times there is that, you know, you feel goosebumps or you, you know, whatever the thing may happen to be. But see, what's become such a problem in the body of Christ today is we become so feelings oriented. Yeah. We become so walking by sight oriented that if we don't see something or feel something mm -hmm. or get a know, goosebump, get an, yeah, we, we think nothing happened. Well, what if that was true with your salvation? I didn't feel anything when I got saved. Tracy got saved in her English class. Wow, that's like, a great teacher. I said, when we met, I said, are, are you, I said, are you sure you're saved? You know? Yeah, she got bored one day with English class and she had heard about Jesus, had some friends who were witnessing with her and she just put her head down on the desk and said, I think this is a really good time to receive you, Jesus. I thank you for coming into my heart. That was an extracurricular activity. <laughs> She never felt a thing. She just yeah. received the Lord by faith. The same thing happened to me when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, I know my husband's testimony for receiving baptism in the Holy Spirit is quite different. You know, he so did, was mine. I mean, he, it, was, it was very emotional. Yeah, mine was but too. But me, I'm just like, okay. Okay, well, I guess, guess I'm going to have to take it by faith because I don't see it and I don't feel it. Did you speak in tongues right away? No, not for like 12 years. What? Yeah. I was a slow learner. <laughs> wow. I got it now. And look at you now. But I, like, well, I had, a, I, had, I had issues. Yeah, Baptist issues or, you know. <laughs> Baptist issues. Yeah. I just had a lot of fear. And you know, you know, you've heard the story of what happened to the lady in my church when she started speaking in tongues. They threw a blanket over her and pushed her out the side door of the church. <laughs> you know, so I had issues. You'd seen it. I'd seen it. Yeah. But anyway. Thank God we're spirit-filled now. How many of you are so grateful that you speak in tongues today? Amen. 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 It's a powerful gift. Now listen, 
here's what's so amazing to me. I mean, I was raised in the Baptist church. My dad was a Baptist pastor who just went home to be with Jesus at almost 97 years old uh, just a couple months ago. Amen. But uh, we, were, we were so trained in this particular thought system, and we've been told so many times that it was from the devil. So when I was in my early college years, I got really hurt when I eventually began to, um, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, began to speak in tongues, and I was so excited. I went back to my Baptist church that I was with at the time in Boulder, Colorado, mm -hmm. thinking that they were going to be more progressive and more open. And uh, <laughs> they didn't feel nearly as excited about this as I did. <laughs> in fact, they definitely told me that it was from the devil. And so rather than uh, going where I should have gone to the word of God, I listened to man. And I'm telling you what, I went through a three-year descent. And here's what they often told me. They said, no, tongues is from the devil. So I went out to go hang out with the devil's crowd you know, I went to bars and different things, and I never one time heard anybody speaking in tongues. Wow, that's interesting. Not you would one think time. they would be if it was from the devil, wouldn't you? I mean, you? right? If it was right. really from the devil, All everybody them drug would be doing it. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, they'd be doing it. So I decided, you know what? When someone comes against the power of God and they declare something so opposite like that, guess where that lie came from? See, so run to the roar, as Pastor Greg Amen. says, you know, don't let the devil intimidate you with the things of the spirit, with laying hands on the sick, with this kind of boldness that Carly's talking about today, with your prayer life. Listen, you know what? You're going to start sounding different. Right. When you pray and you speak to that mountain, people are like, did you hear that? She's actually talking to things. Yeah. <laughs> I talk to things all the time. All the time. Yeah. See, and people will say... I think you're weird. And what you're going to come back with is? I think you're weird. My kind of weird just works great for me and I'm yeah. happy in it. <clears throat> I say, I'm not weird. I'm just peculiar. Praise God. And I'm good with that. Amen. You know, Amen. The, the devil will do anything he can to stop us stepping out and ministering to people. See? Because he's terrified of us. He's terrified of it. You know, I love this. This is a scripture I love in uh, 1 Peter 5 verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Look about that. Keep that up there for a minute. He says, seek him whom he may devour. Yeah. That's looking for an opportunity. You know, he doesn't have permission to devour you. That's why he has to ask your permission. Please, may I have a cookie? Please, may I devour you? No, you may not. <laughs> right? He's, he's being quite polite about it. But may I? No, you may not. No. We, he, he doesn't have any authority over us anymore. And it, he's not even a real lion. Look at that. It says he, he's walking around as a as roaring lion. As a roaring lion. He's, he's a counterfeit. He's a poser. I mean, the, you know, <laughs> he's... And you He's know what poser. Carly said one day when she was teaching this? She said, okay, so here's my deal. Take yourself off the menu. Yeah. I'm not going to be his lunch. <laughs> anyway. He may not devour us. He may not. And here's the deal, guys. Don't fear the enemy. <laughs> Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Yeah, yeah. Many people are like, well, I don't want to get into this ministry because what if a demon manifests? See? What, what if something scary happens? What if I look stupid? What if I look really dumb when I lay the hands on the person and they yeah. die? What if I talk really big and nothing changes? What if I rebuke something and it attacks me? We've done the vomit and the spitting and the rolling and the, it's no big deal. And so you know what people do? They just decide I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. Right? And fear paralyzes them. It does. But perfect love, come on, Cuss out casts fear. out all fear. And that's what's already inside of us is Amen. that perfect love. I think what really helped me is understanding that I am not responsible for the results. There you go. Think about this. Yes. If you led somebody to the Lord, are you claiming victory for their salvation? Are you claiming credit for that? Right. So why is it then? You know, I mean, you'd think that's preposterous, wouldn't you? I mean, you're not going to claim the credit for, for somebody's salvation. Right. So why would you claim the credit for somebody's healing? You wouldn't, would you? So why would you claim the credit if nothing happens? Right. That doesn't make any sense, does no. it? You, we are not responsible for the results when we minister. Right. We just operate in that obedience. Right. 
You know, it's the Holy Spirit that's working on that person's heart. It's the power of God that's flowing through. It's Jesus. And you know what? Jesus is not up in heaven worried that we're over-promising. Yeah. You know, oh, don't, don't tell him that. Don't say that. I'm having an off day. I don't have that much power. It's not the right time of the month. <laughs> Come on, women. It's time to stop using that as an excuse, okay? Girlies. But you know, we, we, the devil will try and, um, in our own mind, will try and trap us in that fear of, you know, if you pray for somebody and nothing happens, you're going to look stupid. Yeah. You know, but here's the thing. When we start to recognize the power of God that's in us, when we speak, we release words of power. We don't necessarily see what those words of power go to do. But just like when, when uh, the lady with the issue of blood, she touched um, the hem of his garment, mm-hmm. which, by the way, is just moving. That video that we saw the other day with, with Jamie, man, that was just... Did you guys enjoy that video that oh we showed goodness. the other night? Is that awesome? Something else. Yeah. But, you know, Jesus felt virtue go out, with, out he of did, him. Yeah. He, he knew that the power of God left his body. Yes. We have Jesus in us. When we touch somebody, the power of God flows through our hands. Yeah. Amen? It flows through us to other people. Yeah. Sometimes we feel that and sometimes we don't. Right. Sometimes Jesus felt that and sometimes he didn't. He didn't comment on it every time. Yeah. Amen? But at the end of the day, we need to come to the place where we walk by faith and not by sight. And we're not looking for a physical result to tell us whether that power has been released or not. That's right. We have to take it by faith. Right. And just like Daniel mentioned the story of the fig tree, mm-hmm. you know, when the, when the disciples were walking along that road and, and, they saw, and Jesus saw that fig tree, mm-hmm. it, was a, it was a fake yeah. It was an imitator. It wasn't doing what it should be doing. That's right. why he cursed it. It wasn't that he just didn't like figs, right? <laughs> People make funny doctrines about just about anything. But he cursed it, and nothing happened. Now, can you imagine the Messiah going, oh, my goodness, am I really the Messiah? My words, Uh-oh. nothing happened. I-, I can't see anything. I'm questioning my whole salvation. Am, maybe, I real, am I really the one, or is there another? Maybe, maybe I don't have all authority. Jesus wasn't moved by it, was he? We don't need to be moved by it because he knew that his words carried power. Amen. And they went to the root of that fig tree and they started cursing that fig tree and it was shriveling up from the inside out. Right. He knew that there were things going on on the inside of that fig tree that he couldn't see and it didn't move him. But next, the next day what happened when they walked back? They saw that that fig tree was withered up yep. and the disciples marveled at that. Sometimes there are things going on that we can't see. When we lay hands on people, I don't know about you, but I've had this lots of times. When I've laid hands on people and nothing has changed on the outside. Yeah. But I always leave them encouraged because you know what? The power of God is working on the inside That's of right. you. That's right, absolutely. We've released the power of God. It's going to work in places that you can't see right now. Right. This is the difference between watching something come to pass and waiting for it to come to pass. Yes, yeah. You know, sometimes you, say, you hear people say, well, I believe I'm healed. I'm just waiting for it to manifest. Yeah. We hear that a lot, don't what we? What does that mean? Yeah. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? The bus? Yeah. I mean, really what they mean is I'm waiting to see it in my physical body and then I'll believe it. Right. Is that faith? It's not. You believe it first. You see it on the inside first as a result of meditating in the Word of God. Meditating just means that you've spent so much time in the Word of God, however much time that is, could be five minutes, but you've taken time to let that Word become a picture on the inside of you. Seeing it on the inside. You're seeing it on the inside. So there's a difference. You know, sometimes, sometimes things happen in a process. You know, there's, there are stories with the lepers. As they went, they were healed. Yeah. As they started to put action to their faith. Yeah. That's why all of this week we've been telling you, you know, you're, you've received the God, Lord's healing people. You just need to stretch out and do something you couldn't do before. Because as, they, as the woman stretched out the hand, they were healed. As yeah. they went, they were healed. They yeah, put action to put it. Put some action to it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there is a, a little bit of time, you yeah. know, a, a, a progression. Sure. Just like with the fig tree, there was a period of 24 hours where that started to manifest from the, it went to work right away. Yep. The power of God went to work right away, but it was a period of time before we see the effect of that on the outside of that fig tree. Right. So when Jesus spoke those words, let me ask you, because um, you said something really key here that I want to just emphasize again, in that our words are containers of power. Our words are containers of the life 
or they could be words that are containers of death. Absolutely. Pa the and power of life words, and death is in our tongue. It's in the tongue. Mm -hmm. And our words are so important that um, this is another one of these things. If you've been a Christian for a number of years, uh, one of the first teachings that absolutely just rocked my world coming out of the Baptist church was by Charles Capps mm -hmm. on the power of confession, the power of the tongue. Anybody remember that book? You know, and... Um, I think, you know, anything has to be in balance, but what began to happen was years down the road, we had uh, well-meaning people who became the confession cops. They became the confession police, you know. Oh, don't say that. That's My a feet are confession. killing me. Oh, don't say oh, that. Oh, don't say that. You're going to have dead feet. Oh, strangling you. Know? Right? <laughs> so. I'm sorry. I've just got this picture of someone with a pair of stilettos wrapped around their neck. Yeah. <laughs> Paris stilettos anyway, around their neck. I don't think that's prophetic. Let it go. That wasn't from God. No. no. Okay. So. That was a non-prophet. So. Our words have power. They do. And you know what? One of the reasons why they are so powerful is words contain images. Actually said, Andrew teaches that our faith is voice activated. Mm -hmm. And there's been many, many different studies done on this. This is really fascinating to me. You know, right now, it seems like we're in an accelerated time where science is beginning to catch up with the Word of God. Have you seen that? Science is coming along and, and you know, they think they're proving something, but really all they're doing is just, you know, confirming, if you will, what's already been in place for a number right. of years. Mm -hmm. You know, God's had this, I mean, this is an ancient secret with God. But we really do have to get to the place where we understand the power of our words. Mm. Because um, many times what will happen is people will say things, even in jest, people will say things that they don't really mean. And what you're doing is just opening up your own soul for a lot of static, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're speaking out things that really are going to be, become a snare to you. Right. So be careful what it is that you're saying and say what you mean. Man, and just speak the word. I mean, just speak the word only, right? you know, and um, like, just like, you know, you heard Hannah's testimony yesterday, there were times when, you know, you don't have anything positive to say, you just be quiet. Yeah. Right. It's I better mean, to say nothing. Right. If you can't be in the position to believe with somebody, then you just be silent. Right. You know, in, in Hebrews, it says, um, I think it's Hebrews 6 verse 12, it says, by faith and patience, we inherit the promises. Yeah. That's not really a fridge magnet verse, is it? Mm. I mean, that's not like, you know one you really want to slap on your wall and you know people oh patience yay That's love not really, never fails you know they want to be people of faith and power mm -hmm. they don't really want to be patient right but here's the thing we need to believe and then we, we need to be, be consistent in that believing yes and not start digging up the roots of that fig tree right. looking to see if those roots are dying or not you know right. we have to we have to plant them seeds we we put out them seeds of faith through our words yeah but we can't start thinking, oh, did it work? Didn't it work? I don't know. You know, looking, looking for our physical body to be the, the barometer to test it out. Yeah. I mean, we just got to release those words and then have the patience to see them through to the end. Yeah. And know that if we haven't got anything positive to say, just, just to be quiet. Right. That's powerful. Yeah, Sometimes really the best thing is. we can do is just shut up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We often need to have the courage to remain silent and the wisdom to know when to speak. That see? sounded a lot better than I could say it. Good job. Courage to be quiet. You know, there's times when you just need to shut up. Yeah. You know, uh, when you're around people who are seasoned people in the Lord, you see this a lot. You know, it's one of the things I respect about Andrew very much. Uh, you know, Andrew weighs his words very carefully. You know, if you ever know him on a personal basis and you say, what do you think? You better be ready to hear what he thinks. Don't ask you know, unless you want the don't truth. Don't ask him unless you want to know, right? <laughs> On the other hand, when he says what he says, you can count on it. Amen. If he said it, he's going to do it. And that's, that's a man of his word. See, well, that's the character of God. See, when your words become valuable to you, then you're going to see different results. It's not just about confessing something. Mm -hmm. We've got to believe it in our heart. And out of our belief system, what's written on our heart, on the tablet of our heart, then when we speak out, those words are going to have power. Yep. See, we could go around all day long just making confessions and saying this, saying that, and, you know, and really not see uh, very many results, if any result. 
But when you believe something on the inside of your heart and then you declare it, then you're going to begin to see those mountains cast into the sea. Yeah, this is laid out in this scripture really nicely. 2 Corinthians 4.13. It says, And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We yes. also believe and therefore speak. Yes. We believe it first and then speak it. Yeah. Sometimes people get really hung up because they, they put out their words of faith and they see no result. Yeah. Well, you have to believe it. It's not abracadabra, right? Right. There has to be a basis of faith for your words to, have, to work, to have a power and authority. That's right. We believe and then we speak. Yeah. So guard your, guard your heart because out of the heart flow the issues of life. And when I say guard your heart, really uh, this word for us in our modern day uh, kind of gives the image typically of a policeman or someone like mm -hmm. that. But really that word is better described as tend or... Um, like you would do a garden, you know? You're gonna cultivate your garden, you're gonna tend it, you're gonna watch over it, uh, it. you know? You're gonna nurture it, see? And uh, so in guarding your heart, what, the best way to guard your heart is to get the word in it. Right. Right? You plant the word of God in your heart, you water it, you, you plant it, you, you care for your heart, but you don't self-protect, see? Many people will try to guard their heart And in guarding their heart, what they're really doing is protecting themselves from further hurt. They're protecting themselves from further, um, you know, identity crisis. Because, you know, someone said something and now I feel like a failure. Or, you know, somebody said something and now I feel rejected, as Barry was talking about. But when we allow the Word of God to become our umpire... When we allow the word of God to be planted in our heart, then the word and the spirit go to work on our behalf. And then out of the midst of our innermost being flows our confession. Out of the midst of our innermost being flows these rivers of living water. Out of the abundance of the heart. Out of the abundance speaks. of the heart. See, because it's really what we believe. We're not just adopting a philosophy. We're not or trying to fake it till we make it. We're not trying to fake it till we make it. See, mm. and I saw so many people in the early 70s who would just be like, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Praise God, I'm healed. If they I'm say healed. it often enough. They just, if I say it often <laughs> enough, if I say it 50 times, well, you know, thank God in his mercy for some people it actually worked. Mm -hmm. You know, but listen, that's not, you, you know, you need to confess what you're confessing because you believe it. Amen. And you know, faith does come by hearing. It does. And, but we need to hear the real gospel. Yeah. Faith comes by hearing the real gospel. The real gospel. Romans 10, 10. Amen. Yeah. It's powerful. It is, isn't it? I've just realized that we have run right into the break. Right into the break time. Have you enjoyed this first session today? <laughs> Praise God. I think Ashley has a few things. So let's ask Ashley if you'd come up and Ashley save us from our running into the break time here. Let us know Sorry what we're going to do. That's fine. We started a little late because we got the uh, volunteers up here and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a 30-minute break. So we're going to come back at 10.45. Now, I'm trusting you you're going to come back at 10.45. We cannot start at 11. We have to start at 10.45. Otherwise, we'll get behind on our program. So that gives you 30 minutes. Remember, the resource area is open downstairs. Help yourself get down there. See what we have down there. We've got refreshments out there. We're going to be back here sharp at 10.45 in 30 minutes. So see you back then.